Hello and welcome. This is Legal Focus. Well, more than a month since the body of Obianuju Undobese Chuko was found in a hotel room in South Africa, reactions continue to trail her death. And now a group of lawyers in Nigeria have joined the advocacy for South Africa to bring her killers to justice. Also on the program today, an exclusive interview with foremost lawyer and rights crusader Olajin Biti Ogunye, otherwise known as GT Ogunye, will also serve you with the rights and obligations of a landlord on you and the law. Welcome to the program. They are members of the Anambra State Indigenous Lawyers Forum and hail from the same state as the late Ndubuisi Chuku. The lawyers are angry at the slow pace of the investigation into her murder in South Africa and are at the country's High Commission in Lagos to seek answers. They march to the building. The gate remains shut, but they are not deterred. Though few in number, their mission is loud and clear. The hotel where the woman lodged said something else. The, the, the government of South Africa said something else. The first came out that she died of natural death. South African government said that she was strangled. Who strangled her? They can't say. How was she strangled? They can't hear. say. G give us the footage of what happened. They can't produce it. We have rights as lawyers. Nobody here is a child. Everybody here is an employer of labor. Everybody here is the head of his chambers. There's no juniors here that are here. We are all, I, I have three lawyers under me. I have other staffs, so likewise every other person here. So we are not, a person here is equivalent to more than 100 persons on the streets. The mother of two young children was found dead more than a month ago at the hotel room where she lodged during her stay in South Africa. At 53 years old, she was the Deputy Director General of the Chartered Institute of Insurance in Nigeria and had traveled for the conference of the African Insurance Organization. She died the night before her return to Nigeria. After initial speculations that she died from a cardiac arrest, autopsy results reveal she was strangled. The Consul General of Nigeria in South Africa is now coming to uh, probably make a defense for the, um, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the incident to the fact that she, he watched the CCTV footage and that there was no incidence of anyone entering the room. So the question now becomes, who, who did the lady strangle herself? This particular one, you know, because she's a woman, a mother, right? Whom has, how do I put it now? Others here may have gone there for legitimate businesses as well, that I agree with you. But because it has become one too many, this now has brought to the fore the urgency and the need for us to rise up, not just because of this particular one, also to let our voices be heard for the previous that may have happened. Because if we don't address it now, I can assure you worse things would happen to very, very reputable Nigerians in South Africa. And that is not a good one. Since 2016, the number of Nigerians murdered in South Africa have risen to 127, out of which five were killed this year alone. The High Commission refuses to address this group, but pressure is mounting, with the chairman Nigerians in Diaspora Commission, Abike Dabiri Eriwa, saying an officer has been sent to work with the South African police in solving this mystery murder. I believe neither jailing nor season of assets is even going to deter corruption. Death penalty should be given to corruption, as it is in China and some other uh, Eastern Far East countries. To the society we are in today, because people are seeing that these corrupt uh, elements, they are not being dealt with accordingly. They have, if you, even if you seize, I'm, I assure you, you cannot seize at least 80% of the loot, the loots are hidden. Whatever the state apparatus are um, de uh, deployed, it must be such that could also bring physical pain to the person. So that is inclusive of jailing and also seizure of assets. Because what actually makes men to do all that they do is the fear of the unknown, the future. 
That is why somebody will acquire, go into primitive acquisition, acquire so much for the future, for the children. Let me even, by word of extension, make it that it is not just only him, but we should also put in place measures that if you still beyond a particular amount, you have, your family should also be involved. Because these are the people, if you had gotten away with those wealth, these are the people who will benefit from. Ordinarily, for a person that has conscience, jailing the person will serve as a leader and he won't commit the offense. But today, what we see today is that we have some people who are more hard-hearted, hard-hearted than Lucifer. So even if they go to prison 10 times, it wouldn't matter to them. What they want is they have the cash with them. What the government should do, don't allow, the, don't allow such persons have access to this fund. It will save a whole... For instance, the introduction of NIPPS. Yeah. Introduction of uh, this, uh, that you pay, you pay staffs through the accounts. A ghost will not go and open accounts. A ghost will not update accounts. That's why that was what led to, the, uh, to uh, um, unraveling this issue of um, ghost workers. Now, um, this um, TSA, if the whole monies are put in TSA, you will discover that if you don't have access to this fund, you won't have access to steal any. So there will be no need for even, you, the burden on the court will reduce. You're watching Legal Focus on TVC News, and yes, it's time for The Advocate, where we get to know more about legal luminaries of our time. Today, The Advocate is Ola Jimbiti Ogunye, popularly called Chiti Ogunye. He's a very vocal a lawyer based here in Nigeria. It's good to have you join us, sir, Mr. Yes. Ogunye. It's my uh, thank for you. Me. But thank let's you go to the beginning of your your journey in life so to speak did you always know even as a child that you would be an advocate or lawyer all i wanted to be in my life growing up uh, was to be a lawyer for me there was no second profession no second calling no second uh, vocation it was just law. And it wasn't because I had either of my two parents as a lawyer or I had anybody in my family as a lawyer or uncle or auntie. Nobody uh, preceded me in the field of law mm. in my family, right. so to speak. And um, what uh, inspired me uh, was the exploits, the relevance, and the contribution of lawyers to national development. Uh, from from afar, I'm talking about the likes of Steve and me, mm. uh, that I later knew in life, and mm. we became very close and some other lawyers like that, mm -hmm. whose uh, uh, work one was reading as a young star and had an influence. on the pages of the newspaper. Mm -hmm. so, and so uh, that, that inspired me a lot. I chose University of Benin. In year one, I joined the radical left movement, right from my 100 level. Uh, and I worked in that movement. The movement was as important to me as, as my regular academics. academic work. It was during the military era. And I uh, imbibed the idea of young people participating in the process of getting rid of militarism in Nigeria. Um, and so I was in NANS, I was uh, in the Patriotic Youth uh, Patriotic Youth Movement of Nigeria, which was the left core movement that was in control of the National Association of Nigerian Students. Did that include we, SUG? Yes, Student Union Government of, of... We didn't call it government, we were calling it Student Union. Okay. I think it was at the time people... Students Later also on felt that, that it became they, they entitled... They be calling themselves government, okay. that they started calling themselves SUG oh. and all that. So, uh, that was it. And um, that prepared the ground for my latter day 
uh, activism in the civil society and the pro-democracy movement and all that. And then you eventually became a lawyer. What was pupillage like? Where did you further learn the ropes of um, law? It, it was then people like me and for our colleagues, it was settled. Because right from the time we were in the university, we already had links with the radical of course. intelligentsia in the university, our lecturers, and outside. And outside. Right. So outside activist lawyers and uh, in it the media. It just had to be, so you had to if follow you are the not train. going to go to Chigaiva and say, it has to be a law, a Kaba or mm. commission law, Shobu uh, chamber. That, it, was, it was settled. And later, Professor Isesage, when mm. he left uh, the university, that kind of thing. So um, I, in the law school, I did my chamber's attachment in a lot of Kaba chambers. That was a bad one. Well, uh, no, in Lagos. Lagos. You know, uh, in uh, Butemeta West, in 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 uh, um, in the Butemeta where I had a law firm. Alawa Kabajon was uh, the president of Nigerian Bar Association at the time. Know, at the, at the time. So from there, um, mm. after qualifying at the law school, new service, uh, Mr. Femfelan was leaving uh, the Alawa Kabajon uh, chambers after being there for about ten years, uh, and so it was natural that. Uh, so you moved move, on with him? Uh, to him. And so I served in that law firm. And that it was called Femi Falano Chambers Day. Yeah. It wasn't Falano and Falano Chambers. Oh, right. uh, and so, uh, and I wasn't alone. You know, there are other colleagues. Uh, Luka Garenu, Shimeke, Oyesi, Bilo Adeloji. You know, of the Bini left uh, persuasion, students, lawyers, activists, so we, we were there, and uh, I sat there, and I worked there for about eight, nine straight years. What would you call your breakthrough case that really put you in the eye, especially when you now branched out and established your own uh, law firm? I can't really say that there is one breakthrough case for me. Uh, in the experiences of many lawyers whose uh, memo or uh, stories we've read, even in the popular media. Some, you know, have come across as saying that, yes, uh, there's this particular case that I did, and then I blossomed and things uh, turn around. For me, it's been a collection of, of good things. Um, and even while I was a junior in, in Femme Chambers, right from the third, fourth month, I started winning cases that I consider very significant. Uh, you know, given the background, my background I've just uh, supplied, uh, you can be imagined that cases involving student union leaders rusticated on account of their union activities uh, were very important to us. Because those students had nothing they only had the pursuit of their career, and they put that on the line. When you challenging authoritarian university or tertiary institution administrators, who by a stroke of the pen, usually after a kangaroo uh, disciplinary student disciplinary panel well, exercise, expelled. who will expel you, your career will be at an end. As a matter of fact, when we are in the law school, we had problems. And what were the problems? Right from the school, there was reluctance to recommend us. Indeed, they were writing negative things about us in our recommendation, stating that on the ground of character, while we in school, good. yes, in university because we are always a toy in the flesh of authority, so we weren't fit and proper to be admitted to the law school. In the cases of some of our colleagues, Mr. Lau Akaba of blessed memory now, had to intervene. Telling and he, he, he had he had the courage, he had the prestige, you know, within telling them that look in the last when we were in England, we were in the West African Student Union. So those people in the East of Court should have expelled us. In the white man land, we weren't expelled. And so if these students are not allowed to champion popular causes, 
what kind of leaders do you think they will be in the future? Those As cases, students, many students' cases, at the last count, I, I can't even count the number of, and I'm, I'm being realistic, I, the number of students, union leaders, uh, workers, things like that, that we've helped throughout those processes. And so, this started coalition right. um, in terms of giving us professional fulfillment and rewards. And apart from that, in, in the commercial corporate sphere, we've also handled many cases um, that we can't just say for confidentiality reason that this is one case that, that, that made uh, us. The philosophical uh, view I take is that uh, it's not one matter that will make or mar you. Even when you have that one big break, that big break will be a culmination of all that small, small breaks that you've had that Previously. then puts you in a vantage position for that person giving you that big break to see you, to identify you as somebody of value that could service him before the big break will come. What are your thoughts on the legal profession after all these years that you've been an active practitioner? I think there is the need to do a lot of reforms in the legal profession in Nigeria. Uh, very fundamental reforms uh, because things are not going the way they all should go uh, in my own uh, humble view. Uh, for example, a lot of innovations have been brought into the legal profession um, which are not progressive and positive. Indeed, which are serving as a blockade uh, to the critical issue of access to justice. For example, uh, our courts are impeding access to justice now by imposing all sorts of penalties on practitioners and parties as default, they think they are aiding the administration of justice. No, they are not. Because our courts are not supposed to be viewed as revenue generating entities. No, you can't be talking about justice administration and be talking about how they are going to be generating revenue or the police force, for example. And so when you have a court saying that, uh, apart from outrageous filing fees now. I just filed a case of one billion error claim. One billion error claim. We paid over 550,000. That's recent. In the Lagos State Judiciary, that's not progressive. And that was recently reviewed. That's not progressive. And so if a lawyer, you know, uh, is supposed to file a process within seven days, it's not filed every day, you have to pay 1,000 error. But Look at it this way. A lawyer has 42 days to react to a writ of someone and all that. Right. But a motion, seven days or so. So if he doesn't do it, then 1,000 per day. To nudge him to do it. But what of the judge? The judge had three months to write a judgment. And then you get to the court and the judge says that, I have too many judgments to write. I, I can't write any judgment. Time. I need more time. So who pays the lawyer the penalty? You have dates for trials. And more, on more than one, two occasions, those dates are vacated by the courts. Because the court will tell you, I have too many trials. I don't want to start fresh trials. I won't be able to cope. So, so who pays the lawyer? So the point so I'm making is that, suggest? what I'm suggesting is that they, they, they should not penalize such defaults. Okay. If they're going to be penalties, these should be symbolic only. Because they have implications for the whole concept of access to justice. But overall, I think that uh, the legal profession is beset with a lot of challenges. Uh, challenge of uh, fulfillment by new entrants uh, who have the impression that there is a glut because they are looking for jobs they can't get. Okay? Thank you so much uh, for this interview. And that's how it's been on The Advocate for this week with Lagos-based lawyer Jiti Ogunye. Thank you so much for your time. Legal Focus on TVC News continues in a moment.
Welcome to today's segment of You and the Law. Last week, we did examine the rights and obligations of a tenant. In our discussion on tenancy, today, we'll take that discussion further by examining the obligations and the rights of a landlord. Now, a landlord is the owner of a property or a premises who now leaves them to a tenant or a person in occupation or a licensee for a period of time. What are the obligations of a tenant under the law? Under the Tenancy Law of Lagos State, Section 9, specifically, for example, the landlord has various obligations which are required of him under the law. What are these rights? What are these obligations of the landlord? The most important to landlords, a landlord is entitled to rent. This rent has to be paid because this is the consideration. This is the right. This is what gives the tenant the right to stay in the property. As a matter of fact, it is the consideration that creates the tenancy. What are the other obligations of a landlord? A landlord has the obligation not to disturb or disrupt the tenant's quiet and peaceable enjoyment of the property. A landlord also has the right to ensure that the premises is in a tenantable state. That includes periodic renovation of the premises. So when you see a property that has completely dilapidated, a property that is not fit for human habitation, what we say is not tenantable, what that means is that the landlord has fell in his obligation. It is the duty of the landlord to ensure that the property is in a good and tenantable state. What can a landlord do if he wants to recover his position? He has to issue the statutory notices, which are basically two. We have the quit notice based on the tenancy agreement that will now determine the period. In the absence of the tenancy agreement, it is regulated by Section 13 of the Tenancy Law of Lagos State. There are also similar provisions under the various laws in the various states. But the duration of the quit notice in the states in Nigeria are basically the same. After the expiration of the quit notice, the landlord to recover his property has to also give the seven-day notice of another intention to recover possession. For what reason can the landlord recover possession? Under Section 25 of the Tenancy Law of Lagos State, the law allows the landlord to recover his premises or his property for the following purposes or reasons. One, where the landlord wants to reside in the property, he has the right to recover that property. Where the landlord has need of the property for other reasons. Where the tenant has breached the tenancy agreement. Where the tenancy has defaulted in the payment of rent. These are some of the reasons that the landlord can adduce to recover possession. Now, let me make an important point. We have seen a situation where, for example, where professionals are engaged during the creation of tenancy. For example, a solicitor to prepare tenancy agreement. It is the responsibility of the party that engages that solicitor or that professional to pay for the services. This is a very important point. Now, you need to also know that under the law, there are some conducts that a landlord may embark upon that may result in prosecution that are criminal in nature. Under Section 44 of the Tenancy Law of Lagos State, it is a criminal offense for a landlord to forcefully, forcibly evict a tenant from a property. So even when a tenant is not paying rent, even when the tenant's rent has elapsed, the landlord still has to have recourse to the court for recovery of premises. Where a landlord decides to on his own resort to self-help, that conduct is criminal and the landlord is liable to be prosecuted. Molestation and harassment of the tenant is also a criminal offense under the tenancy law of Lagos State. Therefore, landlords are enjoined to follow the process in the process of recovering their premises. The law does not leave landlords without protection. That is why we have tenancy agreements, where, for example, a tenant defaults in payment of rates and charges, for example, electricity bill, and so on. The landlord has the right to now invoke the relevant provisions of the law to have the tenants pay that rate and the charges or even to recover position of his property based on the breach of the tenancy agreement. A substantive CJN takes charge at the helms of the judiciary arm of government. In this brief ceremony, President Muhammad Buhari swears in uh, Justice Tanko Muhammad who had been occupying the position in acting capacity since February 2019. 
This had occurred after the Code of Conduct Tribunal had granted an ex parte order which led to the suspension of the former CJN Justice Walter Ogan over allegations of contravening the Code of Conduct for public officers. Justice Mohammed's core mandate is to collaborate with the government in fighting corruption and to ensure speedy adjudication of cases. We are supporting the government in fighting the corruption because we interpret the law and we come with better interpretations even. If there is any case which is pending, and I tell you that we have been speeding up any case that has to do with the allegation of corruption, we speed it up so that if somebody requests to go to jail, he'll go to jail. The fraud trial of former governor of Abia State, Oji Kalu, has resumed again at the Federal High Court Ikoi, Lagos, after a Court of Appeal judge Mohammed Idris got a fresh fiat to conclude the trial at the lower court. The Economic and Financial Crimes Commission is prosecuting Mr. Kalu, his former Commissioner for Finance, Jones Udeogu, and his company, Slock Nigeria Limited, on an amended 39 count charge of allegedly laundering more than 7 billion naira between 2001 and 2005 when he was governor and the EFCC has since 2018 concluded its case. At the last date, the first accused entered defense briefly from the accused dock instead of the witness box and without being sworn on oath. He only answered basic questions about himself before his counsel sought an adjournment as the case file wasn't with him. The judge adjourned trial to August 26th, adding that hearing will be on a daily basis until the case ends. And that's Legal Focus. Thank you so much for watching. Let's do this again next time. Bye-bye.